Yeah. Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're doing a, a historical study of Kaka'ako, especially Kaka'ako Makai, catching up on Kaka'ako, the history of Kaka'ako Makai. And history can help. History always helps in one way or another. <clears throat> the uses of, and the vision for Kaka'ako Makai under some kind of long term plan. With Ron Iwami, who was there. He may not look that old, but he is old. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> well, you've been involved in this issue for a long time, and I really appreciate your work over the years. Can you can you give us a, a, a little thumbnail history of, of where it started and how it went for you in the early years of, of uh, the 2000s? Okay, well, you're right, uh, Jay. It's, it has been a long time of my involvement. 18 years now this year. I couldn't believe it. But 18 years, we kept this place pretty much how it was from 2005. And I was kind of uh, blown away at that. We got 18 more good years where local people can come and feel comfortable, feel welcome. And that's very rare in the urban city of Honolulu. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes this land very special. It's the last public oceanfront land in urban Honolulu. Maybe some people might not agree that it's public now because actually uh, on the books, it's owned by OHA now. So part of it. Yeah, part of it. Yeah, part of it. Not the whole thing. So yeah, just briefly, <clears throat> I'll give you guys a brief history of what I know, because I was there. And my involvement basically was through Friends of Kiwalos, which is a nonprofit that was formed in 2005. And one of the major issues or reasons why is because we heard that major development was coming to the area. And that's all we knew. It just was like went through the grapevine and we found out. So we formed informally because we at least wanted to know what was going on, what was happening. And it was very hush hush at that time. But uh, it all came to a head. In September 7th of 2005, ACDA, who stands for Hawaii Community Development Authority, they voted at a, <clears throat> at a public meeting at their headquarters on the 10th floor of the Gold Bond Building. It was a Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. when most of us are working, but they held it anyway. I could not make it because I was working at the fire station. And my friend, Brian went, and he told me, Ron, it was a total shibai. They only, I mean, very few of the general public, normal people was there because of the time and place. And uh, <clears throat> mostly it was uh, construction workers, real estate people, construction people. People paid to be there. But that meeting was went swiftly by with the <clears throat> pounding of the gavel. They said, we're going to allow residential development in Kaka'apumakai. So with that <clears throat> one meeting, it was changed. And one week later, the headlines in the newspaper showed NB was selected as the master planner. And they showed the extent of the development through a rendering on the front page. So that's when we really saw the picture. Wow, this is what's happening. They're going to build three 200-foot high-rises. Uh, that's the height limit of Kaka'akomakai today. And each of those three luxury towers, as they were uh, described, we're surrounded by three six-story buildings, like encircling each of the three towers. That was the main uh, moneymaker for their plan. 
And they also involved a giant bridge going over the Kiwalo Channel from John Dominic's side to Kiwalo Basin side. And it was a monstrosity of a, a bridge because it had to be at least 40 feet high so the sailboat mass would go under. So I asked this why. Was, this was Ted Liu's special project, that bridge. It, Ted Liu. Oh, he Ted was, Liu, yeah, was, Ted Liu. Yeah, he was D-bed under Linda Lingle, and he was yeah. campaigning for that for the longest time, mm -hmm. I remember. Yeah, and so that bridge was to satisfy the iconic feature that was a requirement of the RFP. Each, I guess, person submitting a plan needed to have an iconic feature. So I think I could have been talking to Ted Liu, I don't remember exactly, but I said, we don't need an iconic feature. Just look over there. There's Diamond Head. That's our iconic feature. But anyway, part of the plan too was still uh, has uh, high-end restaurants. One high-end restaurant was right at Kupu, where Kupu, the whole Kupu Center is there now, helping the uh, challenged youth, which is a very uh, good purpose. And then another high-end restaurant where the uh, Blue Tarp is now, Blue Tarp enclosed parking lot, where Swinerton Construction Workers Park, right there, beautiful view of Diamond Head too, and a uh, uh, two-story strip mall. That's all on the Kiwalo Basin side. On the other side of the channel, they had the uh, strip malls too, along the ever side of the channel, all along the water's edge. And we, uh, we just saw that and we said, oh my, we gotta do something. But then when we, People would say, Ron, are you crazy You're going against the state of Hawaii and A and B? But we to I told them, we got to try, right? What if we, if we don't try, we just sit on our polis and let it happen, then we have nothing to grumble about. But if we try and it happened, at least we can say, you know what? We tried. We gave it our best shot. So we had no idea of how to do this, we're just really a core group of surfers and park users, normal local people who wanted to just to protect the place that we enjoy so much. And you know, we did it. But I wanna add more, on top of the A and B high rise towers, they were able, they were gonna purchase the land or the state was gonna sell the land to them for $50 million and to me, for ocean public, oceanfront land, that was a sweetheart deal. Anyway, <clears throat> a long story short, what, the when people, you say you did it, what did you do? Okay, I, I, I'll kind of explain. We actually rallied the legislators through formation of a coalition. We had a group of uh, 12 coalition members that we gathered with the common goal of stopping this development and stopping this sale of public land. So early on, I mean, we didn't know how to do this, right? We're, we're inexperienced. None of us were lawyers or real estate guys. So one of my friends told me, Oh, why don't you talk to George Downing of Save Our Surf? Because he's experienced in these things. He saved Magic Island from having high rises, you know. And he also saved from Magic Island to Kiwalo Basin. In between there, offshore of all one apart. There's so many surf spots there from Bamburas you know, uh, tennis courts, all the way down to Kiwalos. They were gonna pave that over and build probably hotels on it. This was in 19, early 
50s. Save our surf stood up, and today there's no high rises there. The reef is not covered. Magic Island is enjoyed by thousands of people every day. All Mona Park is enjoyed by thousands of people, people today. Kiwalo Basin Park is enjoyed. Kakako Waterfront Park is enjoyed. So Save Our Surf started all of that. So I called George. I didn't know him. And he told me, uh, I mean, I told him what was happening. And he said, Ron, you know what? Uh, I don't know you, but I'm on the mainland. But when I come back, we can talk more. But he said, while you're waiting for me to come back, I want you to organize, educate the people on what's going on, what you just told me. So we did it. Uh, we did take his advice. We made our first rally at Kiwalo Basin Park. I believe it was uh, in November or sometime. After the, you know, September 7th, when the plan came out. And uh, so we had a meeting, we had about 150 people there, which is pretty good, it made the headlines. The paper covered it, showing that there was opposition. And uh, we shared, well, we educated the people of what, how everything happened, what AMB is gonna do, what we need to do. And we ended with Hawaii Aloha, standing in a circle in the park, I remember. And it was a good feeling because I saw the amount of people that was willing to fight for the land and stop it. And at the end, <clears throat> which I didn't see him throughout the whole rally, George Downing came up to me and said, you know what, Ron, I think I'm gonna help you guys. Because when you spoke or when your speaker spoke, they spoke with passion. And they're not in this for the money or the fame or whatever. They're in it to save their surf spot. And from then on, I made a lifelong friend until the day he passed. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. He really when, helped. Was, when was that, Ron? That was November of 2005. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right when the announcement came that AMB was going to buy the land and build this unbelievable uh, development. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> yeah, with that said, save our sir. Hawaii State Body Surfing Association. Excuse me, I'm reading this. Uh, the Hui Surf Rider Foundation, the Sierra Club, the Life of the Land, and others formed to oppose this development. And we, it was a total grassroots effort. And that's what I said in a book that I wrote. It's called Save Our Self, Kaka'ako. And uh, it's called the <clears throat> Save Our Kapapo, the power of the people. And it was the power of the people. One thing occurs to me is that as successful as your um, movement was, I call it a movement because I think it was, it really rose to that level um, in the, in the, you know, the first few years of 2000, of the aught years, uh, not too long after Neil Abercrombie got to be governor, and uh, he sold that land to OHA uh, in consideration of a $200 million debt. And um, uh, I don't know exactly what the conversation was, but they walked away feeling that th that would enable them to build residential, exactly what you were opposing. Um, was you, did you know about that? Did you take any action on that? Yeah. but. Uh... Before I start, I wanted to make clear to the audience that uh, yeah, through the People's Movement back in 2005 and six, the legislators created that law banning the, uh, no sale of public land and no residential at all 
in Kaka Pomakai. And that's the reason why I believe Stan Kuriyama and a &B pulled out because they no longer could build their high rises, which was the anchor for that development. And they couldn't buy the land, so that ended it. So now the land was sitting idle from 2006 to 2012, like you say, and Governor Amercrombie, I believe this is just what I know. I don't know the true story, but since I was there, I can, I can just say what I know from what I saw and uh, what I heard when I talked to people. But yeah, he brokered the deal, I believe, uh, to OHA to take the land as like you say, to satisfy the $200 million debt owed to them from the ceded land issue. And at that time, OHA knew about this, this law that was created in 2006. So they knew they couldn't build. And, <clears throat> but yet this, they still took the deal. And I want to also mention this as a fact that Two bills were introduced in 2012. One to uh, just give the land to OHA to satisfy the land issue debt. The second bill was asking for an exception to the no residential law uh, so that they could build. So it's kind of like they could have put it all that language in one bill and have it passed through, but they didn't. They put it in two separate bills. So that tells me that then you would have opposition with the exception bill, you know, to so they left it separately. They wanted the land swap, the land deal to go through. And we, I mean, majority of the people wanted that. So even Friends of Kiwalos and Save Our Kaka'apu supported that. We wanted the Hawaiians to get what's due to them. But then the other bill, which was, was concurrently introduced, died because of public opposition. So now OHA took the deal, the bill, number one, and now they, got, there's, they can't build residential. So that land has been pretty much idle since 2012 till now. And during that time period, OHA, as the new landowners, has tried, this will be the fourth, fourth time they're trying. So I think they're, they're just are waiting to get the bill, the law overturned. So, and you guys, your movement has opposed that bill each one of those four times. Yeah, well, the first bill in 2012 was not a, was not a total repeal. It was asking for exception for OHA to build. But our main concern, like today, is if you allow one person to build, then others going to say, I want to build too. Like Kamehameha schools, they have land there. And you can't stop them. You've got to be fair, right? So I think this time they're asking for a total repeal, not to, not to feel like they're being, uh, you know, just helping the Hawaiians. They want to help everybody to be able to build. <laughs> that, I, I believe that's their idea. So they're asking for a total repeal. Yeah, so so what has your movement said to that over the past past uh, what two, three, four years? Have you we, opposed have you opposed that bill? Yeah, we well we're still gonna oppose it. Well, let me just tell you what the bill states in summary, just three steps. One, a total repeal of the no residential law. Number two, raise the height limit from 200 feet like it was back in 2005 with the a and plan, to 400, just like the towers across the boulevard, 400 feet, 40 stories. And the third part, which kind of disturbs me, is they're 
Oha will be able to convey the land, which means to me, sell the land to a third party and they get to develop the land. So those are the three major points of the bill. And we're, we're opposing it all for those three reasons too. The main reason why being the repeal of the no residential law. But well, OI has stated that they want to build just like the people across the street with the in residential entitlement with the 400 feet increase. And now the third part, they want to be able to sell the land to whoever wants to buy it. So it started from public land in 2005 to now being OHA's land. And now OHA could sell it if that bill passes. Yeah. So I don't okay, see that. Those, those, uh, those rights would be in the hands of any landowner on the Malka side of Kaka'ako. Why do you distinguish this land on the Makai side? Why do I distinguish? I mean, yeah, distinguish... you're saying that the, that the Makai side, Oha, should have different treatment than yep. the, oh, because... the Malka side. Okay. Because number one, there is a law on the ocean side that says you cannot build. And there, there was a reason for that law. The reason was, the majority of the people did not want it. And like I said, we were able to rally the legislators around us and they voted almost unanimously, except for one vote, to, to create this law, the residential ban and no selling of public land. They saw the value of this last public ocean front land that we need to at least preserve it as open space or low rise or public use, not private use through the sale of it to build condos. Across the street, there is no law, I mean, that says you cannot build. They're following the rules under ACDA rules. ACDA changed the height limit to 400. So they're building 400. But that's the difference between Malka and Makai. We have a law created by the people. What about the environmental considerations? People have been talking about that for a long time. Well, good question. You know, back in 2005, that came up too with the ANB plan, but it didn't seem to stop them. But that area, maybe not all the total area, is brown fields. Brown fields means toxic land through all the previous uses of the land, because there was an incinerator there. It was uh, the Opala station there. So that land is toxic. And I believe right now it's been, it has been capped. And the cap, being capped make it, makes it safe to walk on, you know, to be there. But if you're going to start pile driving, uh, you know, piles down how, you got to go through the water table and everything for high rises. It's going to disturb that. So they're going to have to remediate the soil, meaning removing it. And I believe, understand you can't remove it and put it somewhere on, in, the, in the state. You have to ship it overseas somewhere. That's going to take a lot of money. But of course, developers have a lot of money. So uh, they could probably afford it. but. There is that issue of the brown fields. There's the issue of sea level rise. You know, right now, that's the buzzword. How can the government allow people to build on the ocean, knowing that the sea level rise is happening? And they have charged that you know, it's coming. Yeah. So we shouldn't build close to the ocean already. I mean, everything that's built close to the ocean are, is grandfathered in now, right? We, it's hard to tell them, knock down your buildings, but you can prevent the future ones. And there's also the tsunami inundation zone. You're going to build close to the ocean, could possibly be destroyed, and you're putting people in harm's way. So that is a very big issue, Jay, the uh, brownfield issue. 
So, um, what do you say to OHA when it says it's doing this for affordable housing? Well, <clears throat> yeah, they told me that. Well, we met with the consultants, uh, and they they said, yeah, the residential they want to build will be affordable. Well, number one, it cannot be affordable to only Hawaiian people. It has to be open to the public because only DHHL can build only for the Hawaiian people. So it's going to be open to everybody. And number two, I cannot see how oceanfront residents can pencil out to be affordable unless you get heavy, heavy government subsidies to help OHA do it. And so what saddens me is this high, uh, this, yeah, this consulting firm is portraying it to be affordable. Oh, excuse me, I gotta stop my phone. <laughs> Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Yeah, so it really, really uh, saddens me because they're this or misleading the Hawaiian people with their all their slick ads, commercial ads, and everything. So I, I uh, challenge the Hawaiian people out there listening to ask Oha that question and really get a definite answer because you and I know, Jay, that the devil is in the details, right? They're advertising a good show, affordable, all of that. But I know, uh, I heard that Oha was asked, what are you going to build? We're not going to build, well, we're not going to spend any more money on this property until we get the residential re law repealed. Then we're gonna come out with the plan. So how can you, how can the people uh, support your idea repealing a very important law that's protecting this place with no plan? It's very hard. Don't you agree? We don't know the details. Is it really gonna be affordable? So that's the predicament we're in now. Like, there's no plan. Well, anyway, does that there's answer? No, your there's also no EIS, and you know the sequence. Yeah, or, the sequence would be first you make a plan, and then you test it against an EIS, and then yeah. you see if you have to change the plan, and then you see if you have to change the building, you know, the zoning building requirements, and a lot of time goes by. So uh, I guess my question is, you know, what your movement has been very effective, very rational, very community minded. It's really a wonderful thing. It's a great contribution you and you know, the others in the movement uh, have made. What what uses do you think would be appropriate, short of residential? Okay, well that's a good question. My friend Jay, who is a board member of Friends of Kiwalos, always told the group, yeah, we cannot oppo always oppose, oppose, complain, complain. We got to find a solution. And I agree, 100%. So we have, we have brought up a possible solution of what could be there instead of high rises to the consultants of OHA. They like the idea, our ideas. But I guess it, when it reached OHA, it didn't move further than that. And, uh, they still want to build residential. But to give you an idea, can you hold on just a moment? I'll get... We call it the more idea, M-O-R-R-E. It is uh, standing for Marine. Ocean research, recreation, and education, and many more concepts. But mainly, uh, 
it has to do with the ocean. Why? Because many of us feel, and friends of you all, that the way to develop land is to look first at the assets of the land. And the asset of this land is the ocean. That's a very Native Hawaiian concept, isn't it? It is. I mean, I consider myself Hawaiian because I was born and raised here. Even I, even though I'm of Japanese race, yeah. But being born and raised here, I have I share a lot of the values of the, the Hawaiians and how they want to malama the land. Yeah, and I think that's what we're doing here. But anyway, to give you a more clear idea of what more is. It includes a world-class aquarium on the site of the Kiwalo Basin Marine Lab. And we have the support of Dr. Bob Richmond, who is the director of the lab. He feels that it can happen there. It's a good place to have it there. And it's, it would be a money stream for OHA because not only Residents and locals will go, but the tourists will go. And basically, yeah, I want to reverse that. This more vision is a long-term vision. It's not short-term. Sell some condos, and in 10 years, the money will be gone, spent. But this vision is long-term. will give more than monetary benefit where we can benefit more than the $200 million from generation to generation to generation. So that land is valuable if you look at it in those terms. Yeah. So it also includes a- you know, that, money can, that money can help affordable housing elsewhere. Elsewhere where they are allowed to build housing. There's no law against it. So that's another thing we're gonna, uh, well, I'll tell you about that later at the very end. Please remind me. Yeah. But we have gonna we're gonna have like a a marine center that's gonna cover Hawaiian history, aquaculture, and the fish that we grow in the aquaculture ponds will be served at a restaurant in this marine center. And like Kampachi and moi, and it'll be like farm to table. So concepts like that. We're also going to have. We want to feature a live coral reef grown by Bob Richmond's crew at the lab, and create a public surf break offshore of Kakaako Waterfront Park. I think it will be the first in Hawaii. And we have, we are moving forward on it. Bob said there's money. And we have uh, Pat Ross, a former head of sea engineering on board too, where he's gonna design the concrete substrate where the coral will be grown on. Isn't that exciting? It is. It is something for the public, a new public surf spot, because all the surf spots are crowded. So not not all of those elements directly affect OHA, um, but it yeah, yeah. strikes me that some of them could have been accomplished by OHA uh, in in the years uh, after the after OHA got the land and until now. But let me ask you this: Has OHA done anything with this land? Since then, I mean, they have done small things like they brought in some, uh, you know, where the fishermen's wharf area. They did things there. They they did like a whole a food lunch wagon, you know, lunch wagon food thing there. They had a a big um, tent. Yeah. Uh, okay, that sounds very <laughs> temporary and ephemeral. Yeah, temporary. I, 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 I'm, did. I'm talking about some real development of some of those, uh, you know, uh, uses and structures you described. No. Uh, I don't think they built anything new. They're collecting lease rent 
from the people leasing from them now. Uh, they have one good thing I see is they have the farmer's market. You know, when you pass there, they have it on their land. Yeah. And I mean, that's good. It's for the people. Yeah. But as far as to answer your question, Jay, I don't think they've built any new buildings or anything. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I don't see anything. So I told you I'll remind you of one point as we get close to the end here, and we are close to the end. What was the point okay. you wanted to make? Okay, so the point I wanted to make is I want to invite everyone out there to our February 13th event put on by Friends of Kiwalos. It's called the Community Informational Gathering on Kaka Komokai. Like George Downing said in the early days, educate the people, Ron. That's what we're doing with this February 13th event. So I invite everyone to come down, learn about Kaka Komokai. It's a learning opportunity. It's not a rally. It's a learning opportunity. So Laddie, where yeah. where in Kaka okay. Makai will it be and what, well, what time will it be? It will be at the Kupu Ho, Ho Kupu Center, and that's right next to Kiwala Basin Park. Not maybe wouldn't be exactly on Kaka Makai, but it's still in the same area. We are trying to protect the whole shoreline area next to Kiwalos, which includes Kapapamokai. At Kupu, we have developed a good relationship with them because they are our neighbors at the park. And they have offered their facility to us. And we can, we, they have, they're equipped with big screens, microphones, everything. So we're going to have the speakers there. We're going to have free food, uh, Hawaiian food. And we're going to talk about every, pretty much what we talked about right here, the history of the residential band, the Kakaako Makai Master Plan, which the gentleman Wayne Takamini covered, which is a plan that's still on the books today as a guideline to guide all future development. But unfortunately, it has been ignored. And, okay, we're out of time. Uh, okay, Ron, I you. really appreciate it. You've given us a great history and okay. you are a leader in a great movement and you've made significant contributions to this community um, and to life quality of life in this community so um credit should go to you for that i uh, wish you well on the february 13th event and uh, in the testimony that you may give in the legislature on this current bill thank you so much ron Okay. Thank you for inviting me, Jay, and the, your staff for putting this on, because it is an opportunity to tell our side of the story. Thank you. Ma Aloha. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.